So if you have a Bible, would you turn to the book of Revelation? Revelation. Not a, not a book that a lot of teachers or preachers preach on. And I didn't necessarily intend on preaching out of the book of Revelation when we started uh, this series. I thought we were going to be in a lot of Old Testament, a lot of uh, the stories of Jesus, um, a lot of the new church and the epistles on the presence of God. But as I came to the conclusion of the series for the month, there's a specific chapter and verse that just popped out at me in Revelation. And God said, that's the one that I want you to preach. That's what I want you to deliver. And it's going to be for today. And so I can't wait to see what God is going to say out of the book of Revelation to you and to me as we receive of his word. So if you have a Bible, would you turn to Revelation chapter 20? Revelation chapter 20 and our verse, our text, will be verse 11. Revelation, the last book in your Bible. Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. If you have it, say amen. 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 Then I saw, now who's I? I is John. It's not Pastor Santino, it's John the Beloved. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. You you know it's already going to be good. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence. Just say that with me. The earth earth and the heavens heavens fled fled from his presence. presence. And there was no place for them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are and for what you do. I thank you for what you've written already. Father, this book, every book, every verse, every word, every taught, every dot, and, and, and every I is already planned by you. And so, God, I ask that, that what's awaiting in this passage, what's awaiting in this book, would be made manifest in the lives of your people. I ask for supernatural ability for receptivity and understanding. And I ask God for an anointing that I've never had before as I release this message to your people. May we both together be ministered by your spirit as we give and receive by the power of your spirit for your glory and for our good in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen Amen. and amen. Go and look at your neighbor and tell them God's presence, the paradigm of necessity. And you may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. We've been in the series all month long on God's presence. We've dealt with holy presence, powerful, abiding presence, keeping presence. And I was trying to, as I put this sermon together, and I, as I was crafting it, I was trying to uh, uh, come up and, and think and imagine a, a, a two-word phrase just like we've been for the past few weeks. And I came up with one, and it just, it, was just, it wasn't settling right. It just wasn't settling correctly. And when I finally came to the understanding of what it is we're dealing with and what it is we're talking about, there's a more complex phrase that came to me and I said, that's what I'm going to name the message. And I'll do my absolute best to make it as absolutely understandable as possible. And so here we are dealing with God's presence, colon, the paradigm of necessity. Now, before we go any further, let's deal with what a paradigm is. A paradigm is a model. A paradigm is an example. A paradigm is a perfect pattern of what should be. What's necessity? Necessity is simply something that we need. We, what do we need in life? We, we, we need uh, clothing and we need air. We need water. Those are things that we need. We need money. That's a necessity. And so we're dealing with the paradigm, the model, the example of necessity. The perfect picture of what is needed. Just say that to yourself. The perfect picture of what? Is needed. needed. The perfect picture of what is needed, the paradigm of necessity. And we're going to take that concept, we're going to take that sermon title, and we're going to apply it to Revelation 20, verse 11. Let's read our text one more time. Then I saw, John says, a great white throne. I can't wait till I get there one day. And him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. 
John the Beloved, this is not John the Baptist who was baptizing people in the River Jordan, not that John. This is the John, the disciple of Jesus, who put his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. This John, this one that Jesus had a special affinity to, this John that had a special, uh, uh, that, John, that Jesus had a special emotion toward, this same John is on the island of Patmos. Now, a few months ago, we dealt with a book out of Revelation, or a chapter out of Revelation, and we had a picture on the screen of the island of Patmos and how far away it was from Greece. This is the same John writing the same book in the same place. And so John is on the island of Patmos and he receives a revelation from Jesus Christ. And this revelation has to do with the end times. Everybody say with the end times. The end times. In his book, between Revelation 1 and Revelation 19, he has already seen Christ. He has already heard all of Jesus' words to the seven churches. He's seen the detail of the great tribulation, that seven-year period. He's even seen the devil thrown in the lake of fire to burn forever and forever. Imagine being John. And Jesus comes to you and says, I got some words for you. I know I ain't seen you in about 50 years, but I got something to tell you. And I'm going to show you through a vision. And it's not going to be what you see right now. It's not going to take place of what happens in your time frame. But it's going to be a time that's way ahead and in the future from where it is that you exist right now. And God, Jesus Christ, begins to give John the revelation of the end times and everything that's going to take place when that time comes. Comes. So he gives them this revelation and he gives him where we are reading today. Then he comes to the next stage after what we just discussed. And he puts him in a place to visually see the process of when it is that God begins to build and create new things. He says, John, I'm going to let you know what's going to happen. I'm going to let you know my words to the church. I'm going to let you know what my heart, what my sentiment is. I'm going to tell you all about uh, the great destruction that's coming. I'm going to tell you about the, the large serpent. I'm going to tell you about everything that it is that you need to know about what's coming. But then I'm going to take you from where you are and I'm going to put you in another sphere and another realm of understanding based on what's coming after what it is that you just saw. Understand that with God, there's always a sequel to the first act. With God, there's always something that comes after what it is that you're seeing. And so he takes John to a place and an activity where it's the, the creation of new things and the building of new things. But before we can get to the point of this great shifting and how and when it takes place, the vanquishing, what's vanquishing? The escaping, the disappearing. The vanquishing of God's created objects on earth take place. Let's look at verse 11 one more time. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. John says, inside of this vision, I'm seeing activity. Inside of this vision, I'm seeing some process. I'm seeing the work of God in the vision dealing with what's coming in the future. And John says, based on what I'm seeing and what I'm visualizing in the vision and in the prophetic word that's coming from the master to my life, I see something taking place that I've never seen before. I'm seeing a shifting happen in front of my visual scheme. And it's that the earth and the heavens have fled from the presence of God, the earth and and the heavens have now disappeared from the visual scheme of God's supervisory agent through his eye based on what it is that he's always able to see. John says that there are two elements, there are two objects that escape the visualness of God's ability to see. I know this is deep. This is revelation, okay? But I want you to see it in your mind. The greatest thing that you can ever do when somebody is speaking the word of the Lord to your life is to see it with your eye. Yeah. I told you year after year after year after year after year what it is that I'm reading. See it in your mind. Yeah. And when somebody stands behind a pulpit, the greatest thing that we can do is to visualize the words that come out of his or her mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
John says, I see two objects. I see two realities, the earth and the sky. And those two objects flee, they escape God's presence. When he says, I saw the earth flee, it's the Greek word ge, G-E, and it means the, the world itself. Ever, ever, ever watched um, National Geographic and they show you the great wonderful globe, the great wonderful marble that's sitting inside of the atmosphere? That earth, that world that he saw, escapes. Then he looks up and he sees the sky that we see today, the blue sky with, with all the clouds, the sky that we see at night with all the stars. And that sky absolutely flees and escapes. When he said, I saw those two things, flee and escape, the word fled there in the past tense is the Greek word fuego, probably where we get the Spanish word fuego from. That word fuego there means what? Escaped and ran away. The earth and the sky run away from God's presence. The earth and the sky leave where they are. They leave their ability to stay in the place where they've been all of these millennia since God stood upon nothing and created everything and said, light, let light be and light was. And he said, let there be stars and the sky and the expanse in between the two and the animals and the sea and the plants, all of the things that have existed on this earth. And when God began to create it way back then are gone. They escape. They run from the presence of God. How many of you know that if something like that happens, God is about ready to do something new? Yes. Yes. If God literally takes everything that he's created and orders it and commands it to move and to flee from where he is, that means there's a sequel coming. That means that there's a part two coming. That means that there's something coming after what it is that's being done and what it is that's being seen. And God says, when I do something, I always have something waiting after what it is that I'm doing now. The God that creates is the God that fills. The God that creates is the God that heals. The God that creates is the God that delivers. And the God that delivers is the God that sanctifies. The God that sanctifies is the God who fills. The God who fills is the God who restores. The God who Resources the God who refreshes everything within the character and the nature of God has another sequel coming based on what it is that he previously did. The God that you and I serve is not a God who is stuck in one activity. He's not stuck in one action. He's not stuck in one thought. God has a multitudinous amount, a plethora of plan based on what it is that he's going to do and based on what it is that he's decided to do. So he says, whenever you see me do something, whenever you see something take place in the spirit. Understand that there's something coming after that and it's going to come after that and it's going to come after that and it's going to come after that and something's going to come after that. God always has a plan for based on what it is that he's doing in the present and what he's doing in the present has something else waiting new in the future. Amen. Yeah, that's right. See it. Mm -hmm. God is always doing something new. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say it one more time. God is always doing something new. Amen. The earth and the sky, what? Fuego. Fire. They escape, they flee from where? His presence. There is to be a great shifting that takes place in the heavenly realm that will open the door to the new order of things. There's going to be activity that takes place, the sky, the earth, fleeing from God's presence for something else to take place after that. After the order of what exists shall be a new order of what's to come. There's going to be a new operation. There's going to be a new plan. There's going to be a new scheme. There's going to be a new idea. There's going to be a new blueprint. God is the master architect of every blueprint that we, he will ever draw. There is always something coming after what it is that God is doing. Amen. But in order for something new to arrive... Now, here we go. Come on. Remember, we're talking about the paradigm of necessity. Yeah. 
In order for something new to arrive, there must be the releasing, the escaping, and the absence of old things. In order for something new to arrive, in order for something new to come, in order for something new to manifest itself, there must be the evacuation and the eradicating of what is old. You cannot, I cannot, we cannot in the spirit and in our practical lives receive something new when we're still living in a sphere of what's old. Jesus said, do, do you, want, you want new wine? Mm -hmm. He said, well, if you want new wine, what do you need? A new wine skin. Yep. Because in order to give you new wine, if you put that new wine into the old wine skin, that old wine skin is old. It's stretched out. It's useless. And the potency and the power of what lives in the new wine will burst the old wine skin wide open. And the good wine and the new wine will fall to the ground void and useless. So in order to receive something new, there must be the eradicating and the vanquishing and the escaping of what was old. That's right. That's right. That is a spiritual, that is a biblical principle and paradigm in everything that's of God. Mm -hmm. The earth, just, just look at the ground you're, you're sitting on. The earth, the sky, this beautiful sunny sky in San Bruno, California. That's God escapes from God's presence. The word presence there is the Greek word prosopon. P-R-O-S-O-P-O-N. Probably uh, the, the Hebrew variation would be the pane, the presence of God. But it's prosopon in the Greek. And so the earth and the sky escape from the presence, the prosopon of God. It escapes from the face of God. We're, we're, we're going to go somewhere today. It escapes from the face of God and it escapes from the ability to stay in within the person of God. God says there's an order of new things that's coming. But in order for the order of new things to come, there must be the leaving and the fleeing of what is old. And when what is old leaves, it understands that it cannot stand in my presence anymore. It cannot stand in my face anymore. It cannot stand in front of my person anymore. Why? Because what is standing in front of me and what I'm surveying in the atmosphere is now useless. It has no, it has, uh, it has now uh, no, no, no purpose for its existence. And what resides in that strata and what resides in that existence has to flee from me. Because everything that has nothing to do with God cannot stand in the prosopon, in the presence of God. And when it's there and when it realizes I got nothing else to do in the presence of God it has to go right. his presence is what drives the created order out of the way his presence is what drives the created order out of the way God says this earth this sky this existence cannot stand in my presence when I'm there. My presence itself will drive what's old out. My presence itself will move what's old and useless out of the way. And once my presence and once my person and once my face stands in front of what is old, it cannot no longer stand in front of me. It has to begin to move out from where I am, out from my existence, out from my reality, out from my presence, out from my power, out from my gaze, out from my supervision. What has no use and what is old can no longer and has no capacity to stand in front of me and so the old order of things has to move out of the way to make room for the new order of things but the vanquishing of what is old has to take place first before the coming of what is new and God as the sovereign God as the order in, uh, instructor God as the order craftsman understands knows and realizes and institutes that that which is old will at some point move out from his presence to release and to bring what is new everybody say it's a created order it's the paradigm of necessity whenever an entity stands in the face of God and within it possesses no application or use. 
It must flee from his presence. God, everybody say God. God has instituted a divine paradigm of necessity. God as God, God as the creator, God as the architect of the ages, God as the genius of eternity, has instituted and created for himself and within the contract, the, the context and the matrix of his kingdom, a paradigm, a pattern, an example of necessity. What is it? That which is needed has to stay and that which is not needed has to go. God stands as the forever existing God who has the ability, the capability, and the potential and the power to declare and to orchestrate and to compose the details and the dynamics of what it is that needs to stay in his presence and what it is that needs to go from his presence. And he says, in my mind and in my genius, I create, I write down the absolute divine, holy paradigm example of necessity, what is needed. And it's not for me, God says, it's for the believer. It's not for me, God says, it's for the thing that I've created. It's not for me, God says, it's for the one that I've purchased and that I've bought and that I've redeemed and that I've sanctified. And God says, I stand upon nothing and I declare within my own power the ability and the potential and the probability to create and to design and to detail the paradigm called necessity. And that paradigm is for the church. That paradigm is for the world. That paradigm is for everything that it is that I've created. And out of that paradigm is this. If it ain't fitting, it ain't written. If it ain't written, if it ain't fitting. If it's not useful, it's got to go. If it's weak, it cannot stay. If it has no use to it, it has to flee from my presence. Therefore, it's not needed. And if it's not needed, the paradigm of necessity says it has to be vanquished from the face of God. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's deep. It's good. Am I making sense this morning? Yeah. What belongs in front of him is useful and that which does not belong in front of him is not. Anything that does not belong within the divine practicality has to be removed. Yeah. God says if it's not useful, it's got to go. If it has no worth to it anymore, it's got to go. John said the, the old earth and the old sky fled from his presence. There's something coming in the future that's absolutely new. And based on what is new, it classifies that which, which you see as old. And if it's old, it's got to go. Just tell yourself, if it's old, if it's, old it's got to go. God lives in a space of determined awareness regarding what belongs in front of him and what doesn't. God stands in the place, the position, the authority, and the prowess as God and says, that can stay. That can stay. Ooh, that can stay. Oh, that's got to go. And uh, that's got to go too. And that's, that really has to leave, that, that really has to be f uh, fleeing and vanquished within, within my presence. I, I can't allow that thing to stay because God, as the architect of the paradigm of necessity, it says there's the reality and there's the construct of what it is that's not needed anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And once it's classified that way, it has to move into its own next stage of being gone. Yeah. And John says, based on what I saw, based on the revelation that Jesus gave me, the old sky, the old earth, useless, absolutely void of use. No applicability anymore. And that had to go. Yeah. And that fled from where? God's presence. So there is the paradigm, there is the reality, there is the example of what, and the reality of what is that's not of God, and based on that, it must go. I didn't say that. John didn't even necessarily say that. 
That's a heavenly, divine, spiritual principle that exists within the realm and reality and confines of the heavenly realm that God has instituted in his own ability to be God. And God says, that which that I see that's old and useless has to go to make room for what is coming. There is always the exchange of the old and the new. There is always the exchange of the useless and the useful. Ever find yourself looking at an old piece of dinner? You know, you ever, ever wake up in the middle of the night and you are just starving like Marvin? And all you want to do is eat that leftover that you thought had not been there that long? And at two in the morning, you open up that refrigerator door. And you know, all your salivary glands just start going bug wild in there. And you open the door and you can't wait to take that thing out and put it in the microwave and grab that silver, that silver spoon and that silver fork and just start just tearing into it when it comes out of the microwave. <laughs> I can say that now. <laughs> I know every single person in this place has gone through that. It ain't even a midnight snack. It's a three in the morning snack. And all you want to do is get into that burrito. All you want to do is get into that, that hamburger. Anybody ever been to Godfather's in Belmont, San Carlos? Absolutely amazing food. That wonderful burger from, from Godfather's. There's a place in Los Angeles of Santa Ana called La Chiquita. And if you ever go to Santa Ana, you have to go to La Chiquita. The burrito will absolutely change your life. <laughs> Along with Jesus. Yelp it, not now. Yelp it later. La Chiquita, Santa Ana, look at their beans and their burritos. And you want to more than anything to get into that burrito. You want more than anything to get into that hamburger. You want more than anything to get into that frosting that's been sitting in the refrigerator for you don't know how long. And the moment you grab it and the moment that thing comes out of the microwave, you look and it's absolutely useless and, it's, and, the, and the lettuce is just falling off the plate and even the plate is old. You're looking at what looks like a wet piece of notebook paper. And what do you say? Well, first you're disappointed. Yeah. And you say, well, I'll just eat some Captain Crunch or something. <laughs> and you go to bed disappointed. But what do you say when you see that? This is useless. This is void of use. This has no application to my life. And as a matter of fact, even if I try to test it out, every, every test out the milk that's been there too long. If you test it out and if you choose the challenge of ingesting that thing, one or two things are going to happen. You're either going to spit it out or you're going to get sick. That which is useless, that which has no use, if it stays too long, make it plain. Make it plain. will make you sick. It will destroy you. It will invest itself in your life and in your body. And let's just make it spiritually applicable in your spirit and in your soul. And you begin to take in and ingest and imbibe and eat that which has no use. There's a stamp that says expired. There's a stamp on it that says no use, void of application, danger, toxic. Ever seen the skull with the two bones and it says toxic on the bottom. That's what happens when you and I take in and continue to feed on that which is useless and void in our life. Because if we choose to do so, we're taking in something that is absolutely dangerous to our existence. And God says that does not meet the paradigm of necessity in your life. I have a paradigm. I have a pattern. I have an example for your life. What is it? Get rid of what's old to receive what's new. Get rid of what's old and void of use and dangerous and potent. Let it go and allow the spirit 
space to be open so that you might receive what's coming. But the only way to receive what's coming is to let go of what it is that is old. And that thing, what? Has to flee out of your life. That's right. Amen. That's right. These things, the earth and the sky, have no place. Look, look at the verse. Then I saw a great white throne, and a hymn was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. That word place there is the Greek word topos, and it means room, area, or opportunity. Once it's classified as old, once it's classified as useless, it has no more place, no more room, and no more opportunity to stay in the position that it's been in. God says once something is stamped and approved and declared as old and useless, it should not be living in that place anymore. It should not be living in that space anymore. It should not be living in that arena, in that atmosphere anymore. When something is declared to be gone and void and useless and potent and dangerous, it has to go from the place that it's been. There's the reality that once something is deemed having no value, no worth, Earth, no application. There is no more room for that thing anymore. And God says, once you come to the place of understanding of what it is that's old in your life, you got to come to the place of additional understanding that it cannot stay in that place any longer. And God has an amazing ability to take the stamp of eternity and to stamp whatever it is that he wants to stamp, to stamp whatever it is that he deems fit worthy to be stamped and stamp it says void, useless gotta go old dangerous potent to your life destructive to your life uh, breakage to your life damage to your life and he stands and is positioned by the voice of the Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of you and says that 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 useless void gotta go expired has to flee right here and right now the beautiful thing about God is this is that the moment it's expired the moment it doesn't belong anymore he will let you know in the twinkling of an eye in a second time notice what needs to go and he doesn't make it ambiguous he makes it absolutely clear that's right that's right that's right thank you God we do not serve an ambiguous God we don't serve a God of gray we serve a God of black and white and what it is that he's declared what it is that he's deemed unfit for use, what it is that he's already determined and decided, he will let you know by the person of his spirit that lives in you. And once determined, it must flee from his presence. God has already, everybody say already. God has already determined the necessity of vanquishment of that which stands before him. God already stands in a position of saying, that doesn't belong before me. That doesn't belong before me. That shouldn't be in front of me. That shouldn't be there. And I determine, God says, based on my existence and based on my knowledge and my genius and my sovereignty as a perfect God to declare and to decree what should not be fair. The earth and the sky flee in order to make room for what's coming. What's coming? <laughs> what is John talking about? The sky, the earth, they flee from his presence. It's the paradigm of necessity. Something has to come in order for something, something has to flee in order for something to arrive. Well, he tells us in John 21, verse 1, 
Once the earth, once the sky flees from his presence because it has no more use. Then he says this, after that takes place, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a beautiful bride dressed for her husband. In order to prepare for what's new, there must be the releasing and the vanquishing of what is old. You must release the thing that's been living in you. I must release the thing that's been living in me that God has classified as old. God says, I want you to let go of what it is that I've declared as expired. I want you to let go of what it is that I've declared as unholy. I want you to let go of what it is that I've declared as unfit for use in your life and your existence. Pastor Santino, what does it look like? Let go of the rage. Let go of the anger. Let go of the envy. Let go of the attitude. Let go of putting God in a box. Let go of telling God what he can do and what he can't do. Let go of every insecurity that lives in your life. Let go of looking at yourself in the mirror every single day of your life and going, I'm ugly and I'm useless and I have no value to the kingdom. Let that thing go because the God who created you is going to put a stamp of expiration on that thing to make room for what's new. And God says, I stamped it and I'm letting you know what it is right now. Once the vanquishing and the eradicating of the old world and sky take place, then comes the arrival of the new heaven and the new earth. After the old comes the new. Something new always replaces what's old. God never tells you or I to let go of something old without having the plan to replace it with something new. He will never leave you void and empty. I got to read this and we're done. In that new world, in that new order, is the new Jerusalem where we live with God forever and forever. And in that place is no more crying, is no more dying, is no more fear, is no more turmoil. Is no more terror, is no more sadness, is no more looking at yourself and seeing yourself the opposite of what God sees you as. For when we get there, He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. When God institutes something new, when he makes space along with your cooperation and my cooperation to make space for what's coming, he puts a stamp of expiration on what's old. And God says, I make it plain to you. I make it simple to you. When I put my finger on that thing, when I put my hand on that thing, and I let you know what needs to go. You see, there's so many people that want to fight it so bad. Because they don't want to change. They want to stay where they are. But when God puts his hand on something, when he stamps it, it's got to go. And if it stays, it's poison to your life. And you will walk around sick and diseased in your soul because you're holding on to that which God has said is expired. And you become nothing more but a potent smell in the face of another believer. God says, I put my hand on that which needs to go. And Jesus said in Revelation 22, believe these words for they are true. We as believers live in the presence of God and what's not of him must go. Everyone stand.
Father, I ask right now that you'll begin to put your hand on what's old. I ask that you begin to put your finger on what is old. I ask that you begin to stamp away in the lives of your people that what it is that needs to go. To put a stamp of expiration on everything that's expired. To put a stamp of expiration on anything that has no use anymore. The old thoughts, the old behavior, the old attitude, the old way of thinking, the old operation and action and activity in life. God, I ask that you put your stamp on it right now. And if they choose to allow it to flee by your spirit from your presence, then you will bring in the new order of things to their life. Just as you brought in and you will bring in the new Jerusalem the new heaven and the new earth. God, I ask for those who will allow a release of what's old. I ask for a new existence in where they go, where they walk and where they tread. May the windows of heaven open. May the skies open. A new earth, a new heaven in their life. May blessing come from the new heavenly realm as they release what's not of you. Open your door of blessing in your sky by the power and the person of your spirit. Everyone who is willing, because I believe God has already spoken to people right now. Everyone who is willing to hear the voice of God, see the finger of God, feel the stamp of God on your life, telling you what is old and what has to go. And you're ready to let it go now. You say, God, this is it. You, 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 you were talking to me. You put your finger on me. You put your stamp on my life. I know it's old. I know it's got to go. I heard you. I, I heard you loud and clear. And I'm ready to let it flee from your presence so I can make room for what's coming. The new order of things based on your paradigm of necessity. In the name of Jesus. If that's you this morning, and you're ready to let go of what God has put his finger on. You're ready to let go of what God has stamped has expired. And you're ready to do it now by the power of the Holy Ghost. I want you to shoot your hand up in this place. God, I ask that you move now by your spirit. With their upraised hands, I, I, I see it as surrender. I see it as submission. I see it as the releasing of the old thing, of the old activity, of the old pattern to receive and make room for what's new. So God, I ask that you do it now by the power of your spirit. Give them a new blessing. Give them a new earth. Give them a new heaven. Give them new realities that come from your throne room as you open the windows of heaven in their life. God, make room for them by the power of your spirit. May they receive it in the name of Jesus now may they be the, the beneficiaries and the receivers of everything that comes from you by the person and power of the Holy Ghost in their life Amen. I thank you for it now I give you glory for it now I give you praise for what's coming I give you praise for what they have based on what they've released from you in the name of Jesus I thank you, Joe. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Master. I thank you, Jesus. Keep your hands lifted. Keep your hands lifted. Father, bless your people. Restore them. Refresh them. Renew them. Make them whole. Give them something they've never had before. By the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen. amen and amen. May God bless you. May God keep you. May he protect you the rest of this year as you live and I live in the paradigm of necessity in his presence. God bless you.